Hey, Fred. How you doing? I'm doing well, sir. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Well, I, I appreciate you asking. This is for uh, Navy Forum, right? It is. Uh, I, and I feel like I know you a little bit, even though I've never met. I, uh, Don Walsh is an old friend of mine. Right, right. Yeah, Don. Don's great. I actually met, he, he might not have mentioned it, but I actually met Don in 1988 uh, when uh, he consulted for me on, uh, on the abyss. Oh, okay. When he called IMI, I think he probably still does. IMI, yep. That's it. And uh, down in uh, Long Beach or some someplace. Uh, no. Actually, it's out. It's out in uh, Oregon. It is. Yes. Yes. At the time, it was in Los Angeles. And oh, okay. He drove some someplace down there, and I, I went down, and he, you know, I mean, I knew who he was, of course, and uh, you know, was slightly in or great greatly in awe. And um, I just started asking him questions about, you know, how stuff worked in deep ocean technology. And he had read the script and broken it down and was incredibly helpful on that movie. Uh, well, he's, he's a great guy. Well, I think uh, I'm going to start off here. Um, I think our, our audience would be interested to know what lessons you might have learned while, while designing and building the Deep Sea Challenger that, uh, that actually might apply to, the, to today's submariners. Yeah, uh, well, I think we we uh, we had to approach it from kind of from the ground up because the syntactic foam that was commercially available that was supposedly full ocean depth rated uh, turned out to be in, in yield at the at the working pressure of sixteen thousand you know five hundred psi. So we had to design our own syntactic foam, and from that we we because uh, we also had the goal of using the foam structurally, uh, which is which hadn't been done. Like your typical work class ROVs and, and research submersibles have a uh, usually a metal frame, might be aluminum, might be titanium, uh, and then the foam is kind of just you know clamped on top of it as a, a kind of flotation jacket. And we knew that wasn't going to work at, because everything gets really marginal when you're diving at, at those pressures. Uh, the density of the foam has to go up in order to resist the pressure, and so your your flotation gets, you know, significantly heavier, which not only impacts your your sort of dry weight of the vehicle for handling it on the surface and launching and recovering it, but it it uh, it impacts your kind of efficiency margin at depth. So if you've got a negative pressure boundary, the pilot sphere, and it's weighing you know ton and a half negative, and you're using high density foam to try to float it back to the surface you wind up it's kind of, it's almost like the rocket principle if you're familiar with that yes um in in, in rocketry your 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 the mass of the propellant relative to the payload starts to get really disproportionate well in this case it's the mass of the flotation relative to the payload the payload being either me the pilot or uh, or the um, you know the science package which was the manipulator and so on so we had to try to save weight wherever we could and one of the ways we did it was by using the foam as the actual structural member of the of the sub so we designed this uh, this big uh, core beam um, out of uh, and made it out of syntactic foam covered with composite laminate my initial my initial concept for it was that it would be like a glue lamb beam with layers of syntactic inter interleaved with uh, carbon fiber composite so that it would be a big you know that it would uh, have a lot of um, uh, tensile uh, strength, you know, for, uh, to, to resist bending moments. But um, it turned out that there were problems with that, and there were problems using uh, carbon fiber in conjunction with the syntactic because their bulk modulus was too different, and it would it would uh, it would have delaminated. So we wound up not putting the composite on the inside. We just used it on the outside as a kind of skin, both for toughness and to prevent the uh, initiation of, of cracking kind of around the fasteners and things like that. So we had to find a composite material that would match the bulk modulus of the foam. Um, and that took a while, and we did a fair bit of experimentation. We eventually wound up with a, with a, a certain grade of polyester cloth, and um, you know we experimented with different resins and so on. So a lot of trial and error went into this, but we eventually, once we got our, our kind of material science down, then we built this big four-ton beam uh, that was, uh, you know, about 20 feet long. That was actually the core, the core structure of the vehicle. So there was no conventional chassis whatsoever. And I actually think that this is a, a very viable way to build uh, to build deep vehicles. Interesting. You had hydraulics problems in the first dive. Have they been rectified? Well, we 
did uh, we did a series of nine dives through our through our initial trials and into our full ocean depth dives. Uh, I did uh, I did nine dives of which the Challenger deep dive was actually I think dive. Uh, oh sorry, uh, yeah, it was actually dive ten, but I I piloted the nine myself. One was unpiloted, um, and uh, so we went progressively deeper. You know, thousand meters, four thousand meters, seven thousand meters. The hydraulic problems didn't show up until we got into the 7,000 meter range, and there was some problem with the way the the it was it had to do with the differential valve pressure and, and the way the, uh, the there was a reservoir that uh, the, that uh, was overpressurizing and it actually uh, it blew out the the wall and allowed seawater into the system. So then we had to strip down the hydraulics and repair it, and the same problem showed up again. A similar problem showed up again on my on my Challenger deep dive, where a, a hose fitting failed, and we got seawater into the system, into the valve pack. But these are kind of pretty conventional hydraulics problems. Um, the irony for us was that so much on the sub was designed and built by us from scratch. I mean, virtually every uh, printed circuit board on the ex exterior of the sub, the driver boards for the thrusters. Because it was all PBOF, it was all oil oil compensated, uh, and it all had to work at full ocean depth. So we we designed and built our own thrusters. We designed and built the driver boards for the thrusters. We designed and built the, uh, the lithium ion batteries. Uh, and there might be something that has application to the battery. So I'll come back to that. The battery management system. We had to create all our own uh, you know PC boards, and everything had to be pressure tolerant. And the, the one thing that was kind of off the shelf on the whole sub was the manipulator arm and the hydraulic system. And so we kind of trusted the guys because it was a proven mm -hmm. system that had been on other submersibles. And all they did was gross up the uh, the uh, compensator volume because we were going deeper. Um, and it turned out that that wasn't an adequate solution. And we, we basically had to re-engineer the system on the fly. Ultimately, by the end of the program, um, uh, we did, I did three more dives. We, well, the sub did three more dives after the, the Challenger deep dive, and we actually got the hydraulics kind of all smoothed out. But the, the, the point of that kind of long ramble is that w w it was the problem we weren't looking at that proved to be a big problem, you know, because we had sort of thought, well, that's okay, that's, that's, that's off the shelf. All the stuff we built from scratch, obviously, we were scrutinizing, we were testing, and, you know, we had pretty rigorous test protocols. I mean, we could have used another year, there's no question about that, uh, but uh, I, I think there's probably never been a program where people couldn't say that. Well, I uh, uh, have been doing a lot of reading about about uh, the uh, uh, what some have referred to as the race to the Challenger Deep. Uh, wh where are the uh, the other projects? Uh, what stages are they in? Do you, do you know? Well, I, I think you know. Basically, I don't think there ever really was a race. Uh, the only the only clock I was trying to beat was my commitment to my commitments to other projects. So I really had to finish this thing at the latest by first quarter of this year. And we actually kind of pushed in, actually rammed into you know another project, which was the release of Titanic 3D. And I had to actually go off and do some press for that, and then come back and finish the expedition, which was a real you know kind of meltdown. It was never intended to happen. So I, I didn't feel we were ever racing them. I felt, you know, we were just sort of racing the normal clock. Once you get a big team on payroll, you know, every week costs you money. And so uh, so it was really just trying to get the project done in, a, in an efficient manner. Um, in terms of the other guys, there's the Branson team, which is uh, Chris Welsh is the chief pilot. Uh, Graham Hawks is the designer. You'd probably have to talk to them about where they are. From what I understand, they, they haven't pressure tested their new, uh, you know, they, they were having some interface issues between the, the uh, uh, fused quartz uh, front hemisphere of their, of their pressure vessel um, and the, and the uh, titanium seat, and they needed to pressure test that. They haven't done it yet, so they don't have a proven pressure hole yet. The, the Navy was uh, once heavily involved in deep submersibles, but now not so much. Why, why do you think that is? Well, I think, you know, I, I think for, for military applications, uh, you know, they're using, they're using the ocean primarily to conceal, conceal the movement of the, of the vessels. Uh, so they don't really need to go that deep. 
just need to get <clears throat> they need to move silently. So I think they put their money on you know anechoics and and quiet propulsion systems and and you know counter countermeasures and all that sort of thing that were more appropriate to them. I think there was a period of time where they thought, well, we need the capability in case we lose a sub, we need rescue capability. So I think that, you know, the DSRV program came out of some of the early early research in, or for research sub- submersibles. But I think the Navy was pretty pragmatic about it, you know, we'll just, we'll just build what we need. But the, I think they kept a hand in the research community via the Alvin program and, and uh, you know, some, some oversight and funding of that with, with Woods Hole. But I don't know the ins and outs of that that part of it. Um, you know, I don't know what the Navy would do if they lost something at, at Hadel Depths and had to go get it back. They I guess they'd probably have to call us unless they've got something that we don't know about. And I'm, I suspect they probably do. After Walsh and Picard made their dive in the Trieste in, in 1960, it didn't give, receive much uh, publicity. Why do you think it was mostly kept secret and the space program got all the attention? I mean, I think I think it certainly would have been the kind of flags and footprints accomplishment that that should have been trumpeted. I, I, I think it was the public, the public's imagination was more captured by by space and by the space race. Uh, it wasn't until later in the '60s that that underwater got got, I think, you know, kind of sexy and more in the public imagination. It was almost too much too soon. You know, it was too abstract. It didn't appreciate the problem. And, you know, when Cousteau came along and he had the little diving saucers and things like that, people started to, to wake up that there was this whole ocean that needed to be to be explored and understood. I don't think they were thinking about it in the 60s. I think it was really more of a post-World War II mentality that the ocean was a place where you fought, where ships sank, and where, where you, you know, you were fighting the U-boats and, and that sort of thing. And it wasn't thought of as this sort of mysterious, uh, scientifically interesting place. What would you say the biggest difference uh, between diving now and, say, 52 years ago, or even between now and your, and your first uh, dive on the Titanic? I think probably not much has changed in principle since syntactic foam was brought in and, and, and research submersibles sort of, sort of took on their basic configuration. What's interesting between Trieste and, and the Deep Sea Challenger is, is what's the same and what's radically different. You know, obviously, what's radically different is they were using gasoline for flotation, which was a you know clever and and, and even elegant solution um, uh, for its time because syntactic foam hadn't been invented yet, certainly not refined to the degree that it is now. Uh, but you know, it, it was made completely obsolete that concept the second that that uh, in, in the early '60s they they developed syntactic foam for the first time. So the idea of a big gasoline balloon. Um, you know, is a, is a dinosaur idea. On the other hand, the idea of a steel sphere with an acrylic port set in a, in a conic frustum seat is basically what we did. You know, the only difference was they had a they had a separate hatch, um, uh, and we we incorporated our our hatch and our port together, so that the the hatch seat actually became the the uh, conic frustum seat of our port. They had a flat acrylic port. We did a dome port because we had experience with dome ports from the, the, the uh, 6,000 meter camera housing that we, we designed and built, you know, for 3D shooting and that sort of thing. So, you know, we, we, we kind of didn't want to go as radical as the, as the Graham Hawks designs because I didn't, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was mistrustful of ceramics because there wasn't enough data. When we started the project seven years ago, there wasn't as much known about ceramics. And, uh, uh, you know, glass. Uh, I know the Navy had tried to, to build glass hulls at, at China, the China Lake project back in the early 60s, and it spent a couple of million dollars at that time, which would have been like 20, 30 million dollars today, uh, and failed. Failed to, to get uh, to get the glass to cool in a way that didn't create stress fractures. Um, so I thought, all right, if we went to a glass hull, uh, you know, that might be a science project that could eat up five years of, of R&D and a lot of money. As opposed to working with steel, we built steel pressure vessels and we, we sort of knew that that was something that would be just barely within striking distance. Of course, at, at those pressures, the steel is, is just really starting to approach yield and you have to design very carefully. And, and you know, another big difference now is that we have you know, com- computer uh, FEA programs that are quite powerful. And 
you can quickly make changes to the design and, and, and run those run those sims and look at the stress fields and, and uh, you can refine the design. You know, they they were doing it all with with slipsticks and and uh, um, you know model testing and things like that back in the fifties um, and sixties. And it's remarkable that they were able to achieve the results that they did. But if you look at Trieste, you know, it's a big gasoline float with a steel sphere underneath it with an acrylic port. And what we've got is a big syntactic float with a steel sphere underneath it with an acrylic port. So the, the principles haven't really changed that much. In fact, we even ballasted the same way they did. They used a steel shot. It turned out to be almost uh, exactly the same type of shot that we used. We used we used three millimeter bird shot, and they used, uh, I think, probably almost the same thing back then, just a whole lot more of it because their vehicle was about 10 times more massive. Well, I got to change gears uh, to the Titanic uh, with the anniversary of the disaster coming up. Uh, why do you think the Titanic still captures people's imagination? Well, I think different people may be fascinated with different parts of it. You know, it's such it's it, but they're you know I think it's almost the sort of the novelistic perfection of it. You know, the the fact that it was. The, the supposedly unsinkable largest ship uh, of its time, if only by a few inches, you know, larger than its sister ship, the Olympic. Um, you know, the kind of the arrogance and hubris of the guys that sailed it, you know, on a on a dark moonless night into a known ice field with with a pocket full of Marconi gram warnings that there was ice ahead hmm. at full speed, and we're still lighting boilers and bringing them online in the hours right before the right before the impact. I personally find it fascinating for the human stories uh, and the fact that, it, you know, unlike an air crash, you know, that's sort of over in an instant, um, that these people had, you know, two hours and 40 minutes to, to, to see their fate coming and even in some cases to make choices, um, to step back from the lifeboats so that make a place for others, you know, or the... Or how the, the you know sort of the, the morals of the times had the had the gentlemen standing back as the ladies and and, uh, and children were put into the boats and so on um, and you know so I think there's a fascination with this idea of, of death in slow motion it gives people gives people a chance to think about how they might uh, have behaved under similar circumstances would they have you know, would they be the guy that was like putting a shawl over his head, putting on lipstick, and trying to jump in the lifeboat as a girl, or or would they be, the, would they have been honorable? Would they have been, you know, a heroic member of the crew, staying behind and, and you know working the pumps or working the falls, uh, you know, to save others, or would they have been the, you know, the the, the crew members that at the first chance, you know, sort of jumped into a jumped into a boat and rowed away, like. The you know the, the craven coward uh, Hitchens, quartermaster Hitchens, who was actually at the ship's wheel at the moment of impact, and later uh, was in command of, of boat six, who refused to row back and save people. So you see the full spectrum of human behavior and human character. And I think certainly you know I think anybody in your readership is going to be fascinated with the ideas of, of character under under pressure and in, in adversity. Absolutely. Yeah, and another thing that I'm, I'm sure your readership is fascinated by is the idea of crisis management and the command structure and how that worked and how it didn't work. Uh, you know, you had a captain who basically went catatonic. His officers immediately below him essentially took charge, and you've got First Officer uh, uh, William McMaster Murdoch, who was almost single-handedly responsible for saving about two-thirds of the people that were saved. He just you know, sprinted into gear. He was getting these boats. We we, we built the Davids for our set, uh, actually had them uh, commissioned and built by the same David company that built them back in 1911 for the for the Titanic, uh, hmm. the Welland David company. So we actually got essentially real Titanic Davids, um, and they are hard to operate. I mean, they, they, you know, those lead screws turn very slowly. It takes two guys to crank them. And Murdoch was getting these boats in the water, boom, 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 one after another, and just jamming people into them. On the other side, they were they were under Lightoller. You saw a, a very different. I mean, Lightoller was a competent officer, but he was it was women and children first, which meant women and children only. The boats were being launched half full or less because 
he couldn't find enough women and children to put in the boats, and because he was hesitant to fill them and then to send them five or six stories down the side of the ship. But I have one other one other quick anecdote I want to I want to share with you. This actually ties back to to the Navy in a nice way. Uh, Commander Jeff Stetler at the Naval Academy, Academy. He's, a, he's an instructor there, uh, and I worked together on a uh, and, a, and another uh, a civilian named Park Stevenson who, who works in the private sector, but 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 in defense contracts. Um, uh, we, the three of us worked together for about two and a half years to develop a uh, very very comprehensive and complete uh, sinking simulation of the Titanic computer computer modeling. Using um, uh, some of the, uh, the the programs that uh, Commander Stedler uses for for teaching, and so on. There's a, uh, a program called Maestro and another pro- application called Posse, uh, and they're used for uh, studying you know stress strain analysis of of, you know, of complex structures, you know hulls and shell plating and all of this, all kids and that sort of thing. Is he still here? Uh, yeah, I think he's there. Uh, where are you? Well, I'm on the grounds of the academy. Uh, we're in the old hospital. I don't know if he's actually physically there today, but I mean, you should you should look him up. Yeah, I should. And he can fill you in on this modeling that was done. But here's the interesting outcome from it. When uh, and he's, I, I think he's about to publish a paper if he hasn't just done so on the findings. But it's it's not only is it the most complex and complete model of the Titanic that's ever been done, and inclusive of the of the progressive sinking simulation. It might well be, according to him, the most complex progressive sinking simulation done for any ship. And a really interesting thing came out of it, which is that every time we ran the sim, with minute adjustments to the to the uh, to the, uh, to the starting conditions, um, you know, having to do with permeability and you know a bunch of other things that he can explain much better than I can, um, the ship would flood in a, in a manner that initially followed eyewitness testimony, but within about half an hour, it would start to heal and then eventually get into a very strong lull of about 45 degrees. Uh, And it would, depending on input conditions and almost sort of randomly, uh, sometimes it would lull to port, sometimes it would lull to starboard, which is counterintuitive because you would think it would always go to the side where the initial flooding was on the starboard side. But that didn't happen because it equalized very rapidly in those in those forward holds, and then after that it was just free surface effect. But it would always tip over to about 45 degree angle, and ultimately in some of the sims it, it, it would capsize before it before it sank. But uh, usually it just got into this strong, you know, kind of lolling condition. But that's not what happened, and we know that. We we know we, it's never there's there are very few events in history described more accurately than the sinking of Titanic. The 703 survivors. So the question is why, and the conclusion that we came to as a kind of forensic panel meeting on this, of, of which uh, Jeff Stetler was was a member, was that it was the engineering team uh, working in the machinery spaces, trimming the ship, frantically trim, trimming the ship. Uh, to keep it as level as possible to allow the lifeboats to get off because you know you can appreciate that as the ship changed changed uh, trim down down by the bow the stern came up and some of the aft boats they were going down six or seven stories with these falls and so the ship had to be as upright as possible so what we were, uh, what I believe we were able to infer from these computer models is that the the engineers none of whom survived actually are the real heroes of the night. And nobody knew this. Nobody even asked the question. You know, you look at Andrea Doria, hold on one side, uh, same same problem, free surface effect, ship capsizes. Uh, Costa Concordia, same thing. You know, Titanic was only hold on, on one side to our, you know, to our knowledge. And uh, yet it, it remained perfectly upright. Now, we, we know that there was a lot of frantic activity down below that, that watertight doors were being opened, that, that pump hoses were being run uh, from pumps aft forward. We're not quite clear why, because they were being run into a compartment that wasn't hold. It's very possible that they were just that they were just moving water from one trim tank to another. We we can't confirm this because the, there's no uh, there's nobody nobody survived to tell the tale. Well, you're, t- you're uh, talking to the members of the Naval Institute in this interview, and 
I'm just wondering what message you would send to those members uh, for to an organization that's been discussing subjects of the sea since 1873. Sure. Well, look, my my experience is very deep and very narrow with one ship. Actually, a, a handful of ships, but really primarily Titanic and, and Bismarck. Um, and and those two wrecks uh, together uh, really tell us a very great deal about about how ships uh, sink. Um, you know, a, a lot about uh, marine architecture, and certainly a lot about uh, wreck site forensics. And I, I, my message would be that that there's still value in studying these uh, these wrecks, even though the technology is obsolete. We don't do riveted ships anymore. We've already learned so much from you know century a century of steel ships sinking. But uh, you know, here you have uh, you know the, a, a couple of classes, a couple of years of classes of, of you know mids, you know, working in their spare time on these on these computer models, coming up with some conclusions that are still, I think, profoundly interesting now, and certainly have have a, a real historical resonance. Well, I think I've reached my time limit, Mr. Cameron. I really appreciate your time, and uh, hope to run into you sometime soon. Well, uh, look, I'm, I'm happy to give you. Uh, give you the time uh you know first of all you know just out of respect for the navy and for what you what you guys do and and uh and uh i'm glad i was able to to bring to your attention what what commander stetler is doing and also frankly just because of don walsh and, and uh, his contribution and, and the opportunity to make sure that the, the world remembers these pioneers as you pointed out that they didn't really get the ink that they deserved at that at that time and one of our goals with this project, and the reason that Don was out there with me, and the reason that he was the first person whose hand I shook when I when I was coming out of the sub, is because we wanted to not only, you know, make a make a case for the science in, in, in the Hadle depths and the new technologies, but also uh, to you know to make sure that the world remembers these these pioneers, because you know it was a whole lot braver for them to get into a vehicle that was designed with a with a slide rule. And for me to get into a to a sub that that uh, was designed with you know advanced computer modeling, at least in my book. <laughs> well, thank you very much. You'll be interested to know uh, a picture of that handshake is is going to be in the next issue of our magazine proceedings. Great, great. And thank the only other thing I would yeah. shoehorn it in is that is that you know my goal in this is to promote deep ocean exploration. I, you know I don't I don't own technology companies that are that where I intend to make a profit off of the off of the IP that was generated. I mean, I think we came up with a few new tricks uh, uh, in the design of this sub, but I consider it pretty open source. And if there's anybody that is working on a vehicle program and wants to know what we did and how we did it, I'm more than happy to uh, to share the technology. Appreciate it. You know, the the foam, the the, the structural engineering, the battery system, which I think was unique, because I know that a lot of people have been struggling with how to make uh, lithium ion battery systems that are that are uh, ambient pressure systems, PVOF, oil compensated batteries, make them safe. And I think we, we came up with a way to do that that we're, we're pretty happy with. Uh, so if, if anybody, you know, wants to reach out, I'm, I'm you know, more than happy to be available for that, for that. Okay, we may just take you up on that. Okay. Thanks a lot, sir. Yeah, okay, Fred, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.